Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the GC3 Startup Network webinar on developing your patent portfolio. We will begin in about two minutes. All right, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We'll go ahead and get started. I think we had gave people some time to log in. Again, welcome to the GC3 Startup Network webinar on developing your patent portfolio. It's the first in a three-part series devoted to patent law. My name is Julie Manley and I'm the coordinator of the GC3 Startup Network. I went too far, sorry. All right, so a little bit about the GC3. The Green Chemistry and Commerce Council is a cross-sector business-to-business network of companies and organizations working collaboratively to accelerate green chemistry across sectors and supply chains. The members are champions and innovators, as you can see from more than 120 members across the value chain. This webinar was organized as part of the, a new initiative within the GC3 called the GC3 Green and Bio-Based Chemistry Startup Network. The goal of our network is really two part, one to support green and bio-based chemistry startups and also to introduce our large strategic members to new chemical technologies, partnerships and investment opportunities. The members that you can see here are roughly 25 members at the moment as part of the GC3 Startup Network, and we are continually signing on more. These startups are able to tap into our network of large strategics through our mentoring program, or as we call it, the Strategic Connections Program. And they may also participate in our technology showcases where we bring together startups to present to and network with our large corporate members. You can see here the events from 2016 and 2017. Uh, including, as you can see, a workshop on key issues such as leveraging partnerships to accelerate innovation. Our next technology showcase will be at the GC3 Roundtable on May 8th, which will be hosted by Eastman Chemical Company in Kingsport, Tennessee. New this year, the GC3 has launched a global competition to identify 10 startups with promising technologies that match the specific green chemistry and material needs of our larger GC3 members. Specific detail on the needs can be found on our website, and meeting these categories is not an absolute requirement by any means, but it is encouraged. The application deadline is February 16th for consideration. And registration for the GC3 Innovators Roundtable is May 8th through 10th, or sorry, the event is May 8th through 10th, and the registration is now open. So as we transition to today's webinar, I just wanna go over some basic ground rules. Uh, first of all, Due to the number of participants on the webinar, all lines are muted. If you have a question or a comment, please type it into the questions box located in your control panel. You can type these in at any time. Uh, actually, earlier is encouraged or any time you come up with a question. That way we on, on the back end here can manage the questions as they come in and, and get as many of those answered as possible. All, all of the questions uh, that we can address will be answered at the end of the presentation. Um, provided as much time as possible to address them. And finally, uh, today's GC3 webinar is uh, again the first of a three-part webinar series on patent law. 
It's focusing on key considerations and strategies for developing and maintaining a global patent portfolio. I'm pleased to introduce Shana Sear, the moderator of today's webinar. Shana is partner with Finnegan, Henderson, Faribo, Garrett, and Dunner. She holds a PhD in chemistry from Virginia, University of Virginia and a JD in, um, from Rutgers University School of Law, Camden. She represents clients in complex patent litigations, proceedings from the before the US Patent and Trademark Office and appeals related to pharmaceuticals, biologics, combination products, diagnostics, and medical devices. So thank you, Shana, Tom, and Adriana for offering to present today. We really appreciate it. I think you, everyone is in for a treat, and I will hand it over to you, Shana. Great, thanks, Julie, and welcome, everyone. I was first introduced to the GC3 network last year and have really enjoyed becoming part of the community. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce our speakers, my friends and colleagues, Adriana Berge and Tom Irving. Adriana and Tom are partners in the chemical practice group at Finnegan, and they each have vast experience helping clients develop global patent portfolios. Adriana leads Finnegan's patent office practice and manages the prosecution of hundreds of patent applications domestically and internationally. She assists clients on single patent issues as well as complex matters involving multiple patents and applications, requiring ongoing advice on patent portfolio strategy and development with an eye towards litigation. Adriana is also heavily involved in pre-litigation, client counseling, due diligence, and opinion matters. The Legal 500 US has recognized Adriana as a chemical and biotech specialist who, who provides exceptional thinking. Tom's more than 40 years of experience includes patent prosecution, proceedings before the patent office, due diligence, and client counseling. Tom regularly lectures on patent law issues, including as principal teacher of the Patent Resources Group Chemical pra Patent Practice course for the last 30 years. Intellectual Asset Management 1000 has recognized Tom as consistently demonstrating originality in his legal thinking and as one of the market's true innovators. Tom was inducted into the LMG Life Sciences Hall of Fame and was this year recognized by LMG as the Patent Strategy and Management Attorney of the Year for the District of Columbia. Adriana and Tom, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you, Shana. This is Adriana. So how about we let's kick off developing your patent portfolio with one of the most common initial questions we often get, which is whether this is your first or your hundredth patent application. And that question is, when should I file a patent application? The answer to that question is really specific to the particular invention and where it is in development. And what I mean by that is, is it in a state where you've developed a new compound or a process or a manufacturing process and you're now working out the finer details? For example, are you gathering data and figuring out why it works and how it works? So there's still work to be done, but yet the breakthrough, the invention that occurred has been identified and you've collected some data. If you're at that stage, you may be ready for preparing and filing a patent application. It may be also that you have a scientist that wants or needs or is about to submit an abstract, an article, or attend a conference and wants to make some disclosures. There again, you want to take a look at the subject matter of the invention, and you may be at a point where you should be filing a patent application. Or you've been working on a new invention and you get wind. Some of your competitors are hot on your tracks. And you'll be soon, and they will soon be making a disclosure. You may seek to file an, a patent application at that time. Another way to figure out whether you're ready to file a patent application is taking a look at the patentability standards. You know, is this a new, is the subject matter of the invention new? Is it useful? Is it non-obvious? Another consideration when to file is what type of application are you seeking? Are you going for a utility application where you're looking at a product, a compound, a method of treatment, or are you looking more along the lines of a design application where you're seeking coverage for an ornamental characteristic in a product or applied to an article of manufacture, such as a configuration or a shape? Usually then, you know, again, taking a look at all those different holistic parts of whether to file or not to file will give you information as to whether you're ready to file that patent application and start drafting. And a lot of times in my experience, clients will come and will start drafting the application and it may be that all the questions that you get from us, 
may indicate, oh, maybe we're not yet ready. Maybe we need to do some further details. Because a lot of times, um, you know, what we like to do as patent attorneys is, you know, make sure you're not get, just getting coverage for that single invention, for that little, it, you know, whatever you've discovered, we want to make sure that we're putting up a fence that's surrounding that invention such that people cannot design around. So again, there's multiple different ways to answer this question, whether to file or not to file, but really taking a holistic approach really is, is the best way to proceed. The next question, as you develop your patent portfolio and as you proceed, is where do you file the patent application? And you know, it's a very simple question, but it can be very complex. And often, you know, as attorneys, when asked the question where to file, we like to then give you an answer as a question. Well, where is your market? You know, is are you looking? Is your market the U.S.? Is it Europe? Is it China? Is it Japan? Is it Australia, Brazil, South America, Taiwan? You know, where are you looking to get protection? And generally, the, the approach that we like to take is we file a priority document. If you have a U.S. inventor, we file what's called a U.S. provisional application. And then within 12 months, we file what's known as a non-provisional application here in the U.S., or we can file internationally. We can file a patent cooperation treaty application, a PCT application. It's an international application that allows you to file in um, a single application that then can be disseminated in, and you can go into multiple different countries. Um, with PCT applications, there's roughly around, I think today there's probably 152 countries that you can go into by filing a single application, but there are still some countries that don't subscribe to the PCT, and those non-PCT countries you need to be very aware of, such as Argentina, Venezuela, Taiwan, because in those instances, you need to file a direct application with those particular countries. And as I said, this international application allows you, when you file, you designate all the countries, and then roughly around 18 months from filing, you, you go and you proceed and you go through what's called the national stage or the national phase, and you can identify of those designated countries um, where you'd like to go into. U.S., Europe, China, Japan, Taiwan is a non-PCT country, so you have to direct file there. But again, it gives you the ability to file a single application that you can designate into multiple different areas, multiple different countries. Now, some other considerations as to where to file when you're looking to um, proceed with filing a patent application is all the different countries have different filing and annuity costs that, that, that differ. Um, in some instances, countries, as you're pending, as you're waiting, or as you're going through examination, you need to pay um, filing or annuity costs yearly. In, some country, in other countries, you don't necessarily have to do that. So that's an added expense that needs to be accounted for when you're looking to where to file. Another consideration is, you know, some countries really enforce, you know, a patent is something that's respected and they enforce the rights associated with a patent. In other countries, there's still emerging markets where um, they may not necessarily um, have the ability to enforce a patent. So again, those are different considerations to consider when you're looking to file and where to go internationally. Um, another consideration are, you know, do you have emerging markets? You know, is this product or is this invention going to be directed to something that um, is just up and coming? Up and coming. Another consideration, um, you know, are you looking to partner with somebody, um, with a larger company? Or are you looking to, to partner or do a joint venture with um, somebody else also in this space? If so, it's also good to consider, well, where do they typically file? Where do they see the market um, uh, going? And next up we have and this is um, this slide really kind of addresses portfolio management, how you build value in your portfolio. And here it seems to be a very simple question as well. How many applications to file? But often the answer is very complex and we tend to give a typical lawyer answer, which is, well, you know, it depends. Um, I think that um, 
as long as you keep in the back of your mind that when you file multiple applications, um, each of the applications needs to be separately patentable over each other. Um, we have here on this slide a copy of um, the statute 35 USC section 101. And here, you know, the at least from the US perspective, you get a patent when you discover any new or useful process, machine, manufacturer, or composition of matter. And it's singular, a patent. Um, because what lands up happening if you um, if you file multiple applications on the same subject matter, you could potentially cut short the coverage that's allotted to you um, when you're given this monopoly of, of this patent for 20 years that you potentially could be cutting short um, it, you, the grant of your patent. Um, another consideration when you when you're looking to answer the question how many applications to file you know it's a good time to take a look at your core technology areas what do you have coverage for what may be some white spaces around um, you know that tends to focus and identify areas where you can pursue additional applications um, you know the other thing I think when you really look at how many applications to file is um, I often associate looking and managing a portfolio with you know investment strategies um, when you're investing your money you want to make sure that you have a balanced portfolio the same thing as can be reflected from a patent perspective um, you know you want to make sure that you have diversity in investing you know between different asset categories the same thing can be said from a patent perspective you want to make sure you have coverage in different subject matter areas so again, um, you know, taking a, a holistic approach about your portfolio, about developing your portfolio, um, how many applications to file, you know, really you're, you want to take a balanced approach. Where are your core technologies? Where are your coverage areas? Where should you maybe continue to knock on some scientists' doors to say, hey, um, what have you been working on, you know, to, to harness and to harvest some of the inventions that they're working on as well? And as you file your patent application and you're thinking about building or expanding your patent portfolio, um, it may be, you know, what comes to mind is, oh, you know, maybe this is a great partnership opportunity. Um, and partners are asking to see what you have. Um, another big question I think we often come across is, you know, how do you share that information? How can you be protected? Um, you know, you want to make sure all this hard work and investment and R&D that you've put forth um, is covered. Um, and here, I think we like to take a multi-layered approach, um, you know, and first and foremost is really to make sure that you have on file patent applications covering the information that you potentially may want to share with a partner. Now, it doesn't mean you necessarily have to have a granted patent, but you need to have an application on file covering that subject matter you want to disclose or you're looking to set up um, meetings with partners and investors. You need to make sure that that factual information that you're going to discuss is covered. Next up, um, you know, when your application is file, on file, um, you want to be able to share just your factual information. You don't want to discuss legal conclusions, no speculation regarding outcomes of what's expected from, you know, from respective patent offices. You really just want to stick to the facts um, and what you've, um, what you've invented, not necessarily um, all the commentary that may, um, that may come about uh, of what you've what you've disclosed and what you've um, invented, um, because you really want to tr try to avoid any later investor suits for fraud and the inducement, such that you know um, you were talking and um, you're explaining what you thought you were going to get, how this was all going to work. Um, you don't want somebody to come back and say, "Hey, look, I relied upon that information." Uh, again, going back to that multi-layered approach, um, the other layer, some other layers you want to think about, um, ensure you have confidentiality agreements in place before you start sharing, before you start setting up all the, um, the meetings, make sure that, that um, everyone is protected. Um, a lot of times when we do due diligence as well, you know, when you're looking to share the information, um, staggering that disclosure of that confidential information, um, have it go through a stepwise procedure. Um, you know, maybe first you disclose some public information, um, do a little bit 
more if if they like what they see then you you know you you um before you let the cat out of the bag you're sort of speak you know you're giving pieces of 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 information but it's staggered um and now i think the this last bullet point here about trade secret protection, you know, as you're building your portfolio, you know, trade secret protection may come into play. It may be something that um, certain aspects of um, the innovations are covered by trade secret protection. Again, you want to make sure that you have coverage to ensure that those remain trade secrets. But then on the flip side, when you're filing your patent application, there is a requirement that you have to disclose your best mode of the invention that's disclosed in your application. And so you need to make sure that that best mode is not protected by the trade secret that you have in fact disclosed the best mode and it's incorporated into at the time of filing um, your patent application. So there can be some interplay between trade, trade, trade secret protection as well as the requirement that you have to disclose your best mode in your patent application. And so again, you know, holistically looking at how you share information, again, multi-layered approach, make sure by all means um, you have on file a patent application that covers that factual information that you want to share. I think we've probably all, um, you know, been in a situation where, um, uh, you know, the, the application, and it may be that, you know, the application gets filed that day, but you need to ensure that you have coverage, that you're protected um, by filing that patent application. Now, let me turn it over to Tom to discuss the remaining topics as you develop your patent portfolio. Tom? Oh, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. And I see if I can advance the slides. Uh, whoops. I don't think, I think I somehow got all the slides up. Let me get some slide help from the experts at GC3. If you could put it on slide 18, please. Well, they're trying to figure out what I did wrong. Yeah, there we go. Okay, I see it coming, 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 coming. So let me start just a little bit, if I could comment. I really enjoyed Adriana's presentation. And there's a couple of things. Yeah, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, one of the things that has changed over the four decades that I've been involved in patent law, I started in 1975, is it used to be all you had to do was have words. If you had words, if you said you had a phosphate salt and you didn't really have any examples of the phosphate salt, but you said, well, I had a phosphate salt, that was fine. And that was probably enough to provide possession of the invention, adequate possession, adequate enablement. But the standards have really tightened up as the years have advanced. And so now I think when Adrian, I talked to you back on slide 14. She talked about, well, when do you file? You need to be in a position where you have possession of something you're going to file. I mean, just filing on ideas might have worked back in the 70s, but may not work so well at all in the year 2018. So you want to make sure that you've got possession, that you've done some experimentation. You know, if it's appropriate, you've done some wet chemistry. You sort of have a proof of concept. You've proven that, oh, here's some examples, and those examples can go in. Now, one of the things that Adriana said, her last bullet point on slide 17, she talked about the tension between trade secrets and the U.S. legal requirement of disclosing the best way you know to practice your invention. Sometimes I've had this experience. People will have actually done wet chemistry, and they'll really have proof of concept and then what they want to put in with the, in the patent application, they want to start leaving details out from their laboratory notebooks. So well, I don't I don't want to disclose that. That's really kind of a secret. Well, that you have to work very carefully with your patent attorney on, because in general, if you disclose trade secrets, that's a bad idea. But if you fail to disclose the best way of practicing the invention, that's also a very bad idea. Uh, and so you really want to be careful as you consider that and do you really have possession? Are you ready to file? And then you move forward and apply all the points 
uh, Adriana talked about. Now, once you finally get filed, you've worked with a patent attorney and you know everything is good and you've had all your proper confidentiality agreements in place, um, how can you really hurt yourself? Well, one of the things is, and I, Adriana touched on this, so just as by way of review, if you publish or present with no confidentiality whatsoever, more than a year prior to filing your patent application under the American Invents Act, which is the new US law that came into effect back in 2011 and the first invented a file part came into effect on March 16th of 2013, well, if you have actually, you know, more than a year, you somehow let your, your invention out of the bag, you're a dead ducky. You've been a dead ducky for a long time in other parts of the world, but now the U.S. law has changed. So you have to be very, very careful in publishing and presenting with no kind. Con- now, you're certainly not going to have confidentiality if you go to a trade show or if you go to one of these great shows that uh, Julie was telling you about here that GC3 has. And if you get up and talk too much about your invention, uh, that could be a real problem. If you have a proclivity to retire to the bar at the end of the day with other people like you who know what you're talking about, and if it turns out that alcohol tends to be a truth serum for you, and all of a sudden you're telling everybody all about your invention, and somebody's you know going back and typing up notes about what you said, um, that could be a real problem. If those notes come out and somebody say, well, gee, you gave that away publicly and there was no confidentiality. Now, confidentiality, as Adriana mentioned, that's not the simplest thing. You want to have confidential disclosure agreements. But then the question is, well, well how exactly do you do that? It is best, best of all best, if you can have an attorney help you with the confidentiality agreement so that you make sure you have maximum chances of that agreement being adequate and enforceable in a court of law if you so need. So you want to be really, really careful. I like the idea Adriana forwarded about disclosing in waves. Just disclose a little bit at a time and then let uh, people, as they absorb some stuff, give them more. But be very careful. A lot of a lot of rights are lost. I've just lived through a horror story. There's a company in Lugano, Switzerland called Helson Healthcare. Helson Healthcare has developed the drug Aloxy. And Aloxy is used for nausea and emesis when people have chemotherapy, which is a horrible thing. I haven't experienced that, but uh, I certainly have seen people and you've seen people. Chemotherapy is just awful. And you're, you're vomiting and you're nauseous all the time. Well, the Aloxy drug was a great idea because that would really reduce the post-chemotherapy nausea and vomiting. And it was so good that Helson as kind of a startup company, like a number of you, they basically came up with one product, which was Aloxy, and they were doing real fine, thank you. They were selling $650 million a year worldwide. And so yeah, that's a good product to have, right? And that will allow them to build manufacturing facilities and to hire people. And it was wonderful. The problem was because Helson was a startup, there was a lot they couldn't do on their own. And so they basically started entering into agreements, entering into agreements with others. And these agreements, um, they were considered basically to be on sale by the court. Now, my legal theory in the case was, I was involved in the case, not litigation, but in the underlying patents. My theory was under the new American Invents Act that for a sale to be a disabling patent act, uh, it had to actually disclose the invention publicly, not the fact that there was a sale publicly. And we had good support for that in the legislative history of Congress. The USPTO had adopted that position when they came out on February 14th of 2013 with their final rules. So we felt that was a strong position. We got our patent to the patent office and we won in district court. So like, oh, this is great. The things are going forward. Then we went to the appeals court and the appeals court read the statute differently than the USPTO had read it, differently than Congress said what it was supposed to mean. They said, no, no, no. 
your sale, it turned out that one of the parties you dealt, dealt with filed a Security and Exchange Commission filing and felt obligated to disclose this. And they didn't disclose the, the subject matter of Aloxy. They said, oh, yeah, we've, made, we've entered into this agreement. And instead of a gun, it was found that that on sale was enough to disable the federal circuit, knock down uh, the, the Aloxy patent. The Aloxy tried to get the federal circuit to rehear it on banc, which is with all the judges. That failed. And now finally they'll petition the Supreme Court. One, there's no guarantee that they'll get before the Supreme Court. And two, there's no guarantee if you get there that you'll win. And so it could be that the single product of this company is now in great peril having lost this federal circuit case. Do you think, wow, who was thinking of that way back 10 years ago when they went and tried to outsource a bit and get people to help them with developing and manufacturing and being able to market? So patent law, my experience, it's an enormously complicated subject and you want to line yourself up with a highly qualified patent attorney that has enough experience that you'll feel confident that they've sort of, you know, they've been at other rodeos before and therefore they can think of these things and help guide you not to lose rights. Now, once you get going at the patent office, if you get a so-called office action, if the examiner, she gives you reasons why she doesn't think it's either novel or why she doesn't think it's not obvious or why maybe she doesn't think there's utility, if you don't respond to the office action, you generally have six months to respond to the office action, have to pay extensions of time after the third month. But if you fail to do that, you end up, um, you just lose your invention because you fail to respond to the office action. And then as the next bullet shows, the application goes abandoned and then you're in bad shape. Now, even after you get a patent, you can abandon it. You can fail to pay maintenance fees have to pay maintenance fees three times during the life of the patent. And if you don't pay the maintenance fees, well, then the patent goes abandoned. And um, as Adriana mentioned, you may want to, after you found your PCT, enter national stages. Well, you have to do the national stages in a timely way. And if you don't enter the national stages, and she talked about big countries like the US and the European nations and China, and Japan and Canada and those kind of countries, if you don't do that, if you don't timely enter to the national stage, you lose your rights. Now, you say, well, wait a minute, I'm a startup company. Where am I going to get the money to be able to do all this? Well, that is why I was just so happy to hear the introduction today and uh, what I know about GC3, I learned this morning. And I thought, wow, what a great company that they'll set those of you who are startups, they have mentors, they have people who have actually been into the business, who actually, you know, have investment funds, and you may be able to essentially work with them, maybe you assign your invention to them, maybe you license your invention to them, being very, very careful until the deal is done, like Adriana said, you'll know, get confidentiality agreements in place, but if you can make a good, clean transfer, then they can do the funding, they'll still need you. They'll need you because you're the inventors. They're going to need you throughout the life of the patent to perhaps give testimony and guidance during the uh, proceedings before the United States Patent and Trademark Office to participate in litigations and give testimony as to how the invention was made and why it's such a great deal, et cetera, et cetera. But you want to be really careful. Could I have the next slide, please? And there we go. Thank you so much. Um, many times you'll find out or you can do simple searches and you'll conclude that the invention you've developed is novel. In other words, nobody else ever did it before. Now, in my career, I've always thought that if an invention is novel, then you have a real shot at showing that it is not obvious because, hey, if it were so obvious to have done this, why did nobody ever do it? So to me, novelty has always been very important. I think the USPTO has been extraordinarily helpful. They've given a bunch of examples on obviousness, and we kind of state the negative ones here, but if uh, there's a thing called the Manual Patent Examining Procedure, MPP, that's available online. 
You can see the most current version of MPEP online. I carry mine around on my laptop so I can check things out. But there's a section 2143 in which I think um, an examiner named Kathleen Fonda, who's on special detail at the Patent Office, she put together six or seven years ago all the Federal Circuit cases that, that relate to obviousness. And they're excellent guidelines, and you can peruse those. And if it turns out that, you know, you just basically, your chemistry, you took two prior elements, you combined them using a known method, you got a predictable result, no, that's probably going to be obvious. Uh, maybe there'll be some unexpected result. Maybe you'll have had terrific commercial success, failure of others. There's stories to tell here, but that's a starting point. So well, that's one thing to think about. The next one is if you just basically, there were some, say in your chemistry, you're reacting A plus B to get C, and people in, in the past had reacted A plus F to get C, and as you just substituted one element, but these are known elements, B and, and F were known elements, and it was predictable. If it was predictable, then you run into an issue. Now, there's a real tension here, and this tension has developed in the last five to seven years of US jurisprudence. It turns out that if you make a big, big deal before the USPTO, if your attorney goes totally overboard, oh, it's so unpredictable, it's so unpredictable, oh, nobody figured this out, well, that's going to hurt you, possibly on whether you were the in possession of the invention or whether you were the enabled if it was so darn unpredictable. So these categories, these are good things to read through. I see we're getting close to Q&A time, so I won't read all of these, but I thought slide 19 was a really, really helpful slide. Now, if we could go to my last slide, please, which is slide 20. Now, what you want to do as a startup and you've got the inventors working for you. And of course, that's another story. Do you really own all the rights? Did the, or the inventors obligated to assign to you? Did they have other entities? You gotta check all that out. Ownership is key. So you wanna make sure that the people you're working with, and this happens sometimes with university people, oh, they have, they have obligations to somebody else. And then they give it to you, but they had rights they should have also assigned to the university. Then you get into a big hassle, so you have to think all that out. But ask questions during preparation of the patent application and during prosecution. You want to ask your attorney about everything you can think of. And if your attorney is doing her job, which we're going to presume well, she'll ask you a lot of questions because she's going to want to know how do you how do how do you have possession? You know, um, how is it in the, What kind of wet chemistry do you have? What have you shown? So you want to go through all that with your attorney. And you know, the more questions they ask you, the more secure you should feel. Now, I'm not a real fan of doing questions and answers in writing because of US discovery later on. I think if you can talk orally with your attorney, or if you can do it over at WebEx where there's no written record that's passed, say, from the attorney to you, that can be really good because you got to think about the old saw, anything you write can and probably will be used against you. And again, one last point, and then we'll get on to the Q&A. Remember, a patent. A patent, I used to, well, I teach, I've taught volunteer, voluntarily, I've taught law schools for 20, 25 years. Uh, as, a, as a volunteer, we always teach the students, a patent gives you a right to exclude. It does not give you a right to use because you may be dominated by someone else's patent. So at some point in the game, you got to figure out before you start to commercialize, they have things that uh, Adriana mentioned, and freedom to operate opinions. You got to make sure that you can produce without infringing somebody else's patent, getting perhaps enjoined, and then the whole thing falls apart. Well, that's everything I wanted to say. So I believe I now turn it to Shana to do Q&A. Great. Thank you, Tom. We will now move into the question and answer portion of our program. As a reminder, you can submit your questions by typing them in the questions box on the control panel. So to start us off, how can a company identify and harvest their inventions? I can take that one, Shana. This is Adriana. Um, you know, we this is this is a, a question we also get asked a lot. Um, you know, and I think one of the 
best ways that you can identify and harvest, you know, key inventions is um, you can be very proactive. You can go out, knock on your scientist's doors, do a proactive invention sweep, so to speak, um, having certain invention disclosure forms already ready to go, um, easily accessible to the scientists. Um, having, you know, luncheon seminars maybe every, you know, couple months or every quarter where you have a harvest section session that, you know, you have a bunch of scientists get together and have think tanks about what you got, what everybody's doing and developing, um, you know, working with R&D and the product managers or, you know, maybe you're a company that, does, that isn't at that level yet, um, but doing simple luncheons. Um, just getting people talking and talking about innovation and what they're actually doing um, and having, you know, kind of a really easy form to fill out really makes it easy for the scientists to, oh, yeah, you know what, I j was just working on this and a really easy form, you know, summarize everything um, and then, you know, take a look at the end of the day and see where you where you are, you know, where everybody is. Um, and then, you know, I know some companies also do, um, you know, an invention submission boards or patent committees, um, having uh, inventor awards as well it tends to spur in innovation and really kind of the disclosure of that innovation within the company too. And if a company... Oh, and Michelle, let yeah. one cautionary note to what uh, Adrian said, because I agree with everything she said. I have found that the harshest critics of patentability and of innovation are the inventors themselves. It's like you know, people were born humble, uh, raised modest, and so you have these luncheons and you do all the things that you just said. Well, if you come up with something, oh yeah, but it's no big deal. And really, and then you find out, and then a lot of times people will say, oh yeah, but it's already known. Don't stop there. Don't stop there because it turns out that often, the way it was already known, it was known within the company, but it's never been publicly disclosed. And so there's no reason, there's going to be no public event, public disclosure that would preclude you from obtaining patent perfection. So don't give up too easily. And I do not know why inventors are such negative Nellies. I mean, some of them are really egomaniacs, but in general, oh no, no big deal, no big deal. So you gotta get them to talk and then don't let them shut you off too quickly because it may well be that what they have done is absolutely novel. It will prove to be non-obvious. It could be a cornerstone of your company to develop your company or to be able to license to others uh, to you know, get funding to move your company along. So that's, that's what I throw in. Shana, sorry to interrupt you. I'll, I'll turn, you, turn it back to you. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. I was going to ask if a company thinks they have an invention that's worthy of a patent, um, what are the first three steps they should take? Well, I'd be happy to take a shot at that. Then Adriana can correct all of my errors. I would say if they believe they have something that's worthy of an invention, step one is, is to say, don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't put, let it out outside the company. I mean, I think you've got to keep it internal. You don't want people running off publishing. And now in the new days, there's these things called Twitter. There's these things called blogs and you know, social media. People have more ways to shoot themselves in the foot than they did back in the 70s when I began. So you've really got to train your people, that, hey, you come up with something, hey, this is really cool. Keep it inside the company. Don't go outside the company. Now, the second thing is once somebody has what they think is an invention, you're going to need at some point, it's going to be very helpful to have corroboration of that invention. So they should go talk to somebody who's not involved with them in the research. Now, if you're a small enough company, that's impossible. It will be me, myself, and, and I, right? But if there's you know, you got five people working and they only work with a couple of them, have them go talk to somebody and say, hey, this is what I've come up with. And what do you think? And then the, say, don't tell anybody, but what do you think? And then you can get kind of an objective view because the people aren't involved. So if you run through those two steps and people are sort of, if you overcome the negative Nellyism and get to realize, well, gee, yeah, nobody, you know, they can do some simple searches. Searching is so much easier to do by technical people with computers. And they say, well, no, we can't find this. Nobody's ever done 
exactly what we have in mind. So it looks like we have novel subject matter. Then you can go through that slide that I just went through with you, that slide 19. You can look at some basic obvious questions. How does it stack up? But then the third thing to do, as I see it, uh, the third thing is then you need to get legal counsel as soon as you can and get it so you'll have a confidential agreement, uh, a confidentiality with your lawyer, they're your counsel, they have att attorney-client privilege, they are ethically forbidden from letting your information out of the bag, which of course bespeaks, make sure you get a reputable lawyer. I, I heard somebody say once, maybe this is general experience of lawyers, what do you have when you have seven lawyers up to their necks in cement? And the answer is not enough cement. So you basically want to make sure you're dealing with reputable lawyers, experienced lawyers, and you sort of turn it to them and then let them be the orchestra conductor from there in bringing your, your patent application to fruition, filing, and, and then through prosecution. Um, Adriana, would you like to add anything to that? Um, Tom, I would just really echo your comments, and I think, you know, you gave the great example of Helsin about, um, you know, you, you just got to keep it all internally first. Um, I know it can be very exciting, and scientists love to publish. Um, you know, they want to get out there. They want to talk about what they've been doing, um, and it just lands up shooting, um, shooting you in the foot later on when they make those disclosures. And, you know, to the best of the ability that you can corral everybody and keep it internally, I mean, that really is is the name of the game at that early stage. Um, and, you know, you may still need to do some additional research or some additional data collection points. Um, but again, just keeping it internally, I think, is, is you know, definitely the first step, the first step in the right direction. Yeah, and I think that what, I agree with everything Adriana said. And basically the problem with Helson is they needed money. They needed yeah. money because they had no ability to really market, or they had no ability to do clinical trials to get FDA approval. They needed to go outside to get the money. Now, the deal is, uh, and I, I would much rather talk about mistakes that other people have made rather than defend my own mistakes, which they're <laughs> I say, I say that. I've made plenty of them over 40 years. It was more fun to talk about the mistakes of others. The mistake that was made there is before they went out, before they went out to essentially find someone that they could partner up with. And these are, this is like, you know, it's vertical integration, but it's not within your company. So you've got to go outs outsourcing is the word I hear most often. I think it's pretty accurate. Before you go out and outsource, you need to get the patent application on file. Had Helson filed their patent application before they um, ran into doing all their outsourcing, and doing the difficult things. Now, I still think Helson should win, but looking at this in a worst case scenario and where they are today, um, you look at this for lessons learned, get your application filed. Make sure it's on file before you go out to do the vertical integration. Now, here's a key thing. I bet Adrian and Shane will agree with me is, okay, so you think you got something, you think it's in your possession, you think it's novel, You've gone through that little chart on page uh, slide 19. Oh yeah, I think we can make arguments here that this is not obvious. One of the things you've got to do with your lawyer is you need a lawyer that will pay personal attention to you. Uh, complaints I hear over and over again from people as well, we, we're coming to you because we have the lawyer and they didn't pay any attention to us and they let things be delayed. Now, letting things be, be delayed in an absolute novelty world is, as we now live in with that, you, but we do have that one-year exception under the American Invents Act, delay is just not good. So you want to work with someone and you can't rush off and do it in a half-baked manner. It's got to be done carefully, but you want to make sure that you're working with someone who is going to pay attention and that they will answer your phone calls, uh, do things like that, be responsive to you, not hide from you because they haven't done the work and make sure the work gets done in a reasonable time. I mean, you can't do these things in one day, but you don't want to do it in a year either because the more time it takes where you're waiting for the attorney to essentially do your work, tremendous pressure 
may come upon you. You need funding. You know, there's mortgages to be paid. There's, you know, groceries to be bought for, you know, you and yours. And you're just in a terrible situation. So try to get someone, try to get someone that's really competent and then make sure you get someone that will pay attention to you and move your invention along in what I would call expeditious manner so that it gets filed in a timely way. Adriana, any comment on that? No, I totally agree with you, Tom. And, you know, I think, um, again, you, you highlight some really good key issues there that, you know, um, you know, getting it done expeditiously and, you know, having the right legal counsel, um, you know, if you start filing with a provisional application, you know, that, that placeholder in line to get you the date, you need to make sure that what is filed is going to be sufficient enough to give you um, the support that you need later on when you file your PCT application or a non-provisional application. Um, you know, timing may be of the essence, too, with respect to not only paying your mortgage, but maybe what your other competitors are doing as well. Um, you know, a lot of times scientists know, um, you know, where each of their competitors are, where they're going and what they're looking to do. Um, you know, keeping your, your ear to the ground and understanding that as well is, is helpful. Um, I think it also gives you that competitive edge. Um, but you, you need to keep track of all these things. You need to, be, you know, like you said, Tom, you need somebody out there advocating for you and, and doing it expeditiously and at the same time um, ensuring that you're getting all the rights or, you know, your rights are secured when you file that original, um, you know, provisional application when you're, when you're putting your mark in the sand, so to speak. Yeah, I, I thought that was a brilliant comment and I agree completely. And one of the things you raised that I had not raised was the idea of a provisional application. Now, why do you want a provisional application? The clock, the 20 year clock on the patent term does not start with the provisional. It starts with a non-provisional, which can be one year later. That could be one year after you filed the provisional, you can file a non-provisional. And I think in the early days, I think provisional applications came into vogue in about 1994, 1995. People were writing out disclosures on the back of envelopes and finally that was the USPTO. And then as I said, well, then a year later, they would write out, you know, they would write out a real patent application and find out that they weren't entitled to the benefit. You want to be entitled as, to the extent you can to be the, to entitled to the benefit of the filing date of the provisional application. So I think I know the way Adriana does it and Shana does it, and I try to do it, is the provisional application, we try to make that a full-blown application. And maybe you'll have some new things to add when you get a year later and do the um, the non-provisional, but we like to see the provisional as robust as it possibly can be so that it'll be a good basis for you when you get in and, and you file, you find out, oh, gee, unbeknownst to me, between this time I filed the provisional application and the non-provisional, ah, University X published. God, they published on my invention. Well, if you can't get the benefit, of your provisional patent application date benefit, you will you will run into a real possible problem because then it will be prior art uh, ahead of you, and then you're going to have to say, well, gee, do I fall in? There's exceptions to like 102A1, which is the basic prior art provision. There's 102B1, 102B2, but then you have to start being able to carve into these exceptions. And if you don't have to use exceptions. Good for you, because if you can just get it allowed because you've got such great, robust provisional application, you clearly have date benefit of your claims, then you just say, oh, I've got date benefit. And so essentially, that intervening publication by University X, oh, that's not 102A1 part against me, because my effective filing date is the date of the provisional application. So yeah, that's an important thing to remember, just because somebody says provisional, don't think, oh yeah, I'll do that on the back of the envelope. Now, I bet Adriana and Shane have all, have all we've all seen situations. You get a call at uh, two o'clock in the afternoon and somebody says, oh, at three o'clock, we're gonna make a public disclosure. What can you do for me? Well, you almost wanna turn religious and say, we'll be sure to pray for you. But <laughs> if you want some kind of legal advice, right? And so you may say, oh, what are you gonna say? What are you gonna say? Send me the speech. And you may do what you can do with that in the two or three hour period and file that.
because you have no other option. They're going to disclose. There's going to be a publication. There'll be a public disclosure. And if you don't get that provisional on file, then you'll have something that's out there essentially ahead. And maybe you'll be able to get an exception later on under 102v1. But again, it's easier and it's more efficient not to have to live on exceptions. It's probably, you know, it's probably like in the political scene, world, having to live on continuing resolutions, right? We fund the government <laughs> every two weeks. I'm not political, this is not a political show, but I don't think any of us you know, really like that. We have get the budget done, you know, get it all done. Let's get it done so it's set. With the provisional, same thing. Try to make sure that you've got a very, very solid provisional, do everything you can, and try to get a hold of your patent attorney, not the day you're going to disclose. Try to get a hold of them a couple of weeks in advance. Give the poor patent attorney a time to help protect your rights rather than coming in at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, in an hour, I'm going to disclose. Now, I think Adrian and Shannon agree. You've got until midnight that day to do it. But boy, I talk about being under the gun. You're really under the gun. Anything you have to do in one day you have to be a whole lot smarter than I am to do something very great in one day. Usually reflection is a good thing. Uh, anyway, I, I probably went on too long about that, but I'll turn it uh, back down to Shana. Thanks, Tom. Um, it looks like we have time for about one more question. Do you guys have suggestions for how a company can build awareness within the company about the importance of patents and other intellectual property? Adriana, would you like to do that? Because you you handled that beautifully in your main address. Sure, sure. You know, I think, um, you know, it's, um, you know, depending on the organization and where, you know, where it lies on the spectrum now, patent protection and the value, um, you can do it a couple different ways. I mean, you know, I think going out there and advocating and, um, you know, uh, showing maybe uh, is probably better than just talking about it, but you know you can show in comparison to your competitors. You know where do you where do you rank? Um, look, guys, you know they filed five, six, ten applications last year, and here we are. We only filed one. Um, you know we want to shore up our market share. We want to be that competitor. We want to be aggressive. We want to be um, you know on the cutting edge. Let's make sure you know we spend a lot of time and money on research. We need to be able to protect it. And you know doing practical things like that sometimes goes a long way to really showing and having people understand really where does the value come from? Because it may be at some point in time you not only can use those. Um, patent applications to protect what you have, but you can also bring value back to the company. It may be that you can cross license some of those patent applications, maybe not necessarily to your competitors, but maybe in a different market share, or maybe even to your competitors um, that's pursuing it, you know, and using the invention in a different manner, but yet still covered by your invention. And so, you know, getting out there and showing, you know, where you guys are in comparison to competitors, um, how you can add value back to the company. Again, you know, as a startup, you're, you need to have that value back to the company, how you can do that. And that may be through cross-licensing. Um, you know, I think those are probably two good examples of really informing people the value that IP protection, whether it's patents, whether it's also trademarks. You also got to be thinking about trademarks. The same thing with design applications. If you've got an ornamental aspect of a product, um, you know, you can, you know, again, think outside the box and you may be able to get some design protection there as well. Tom? I couldn't say it any better than that. I, I think let's leave it right there. I know we're running up against the hour, and that was a, a, a robust and a complete answer. <laughs> yes, we are running out of time, um, but we do have some additional pending questions. So I would say feel free to submit your questions through GC3, um, and we will try to respond to them. I want to thank uh, Adriana and Tom again for a wonderful presentation. And back over to you, Julie. Well, thank you all very, very much, Sheena, Adriana, and Tom. Thank you for putting patent law into a realistic language that we can all understand and apply. So thank you very much. It was a great way to kick off our three-part series. So as you can see on the screen, we have two additional parts that you're welcome to 
register for any one or both of those online. As a reminder, uh, the uh, we certainly encourage any startup to apply for the uh, presentation opportunity at the Technology Showcase on May 8th. The deadline is February 16th at the link shown there. It's also on the, uh, the GC3 website. And registration is open for the GC3 Innovators Roundtable. It's May 8th through 10th in um, Kingsport, Tennessee. Registration is open on the GC3 website. So with that, again, I'd like to thank Shana, Adriana, and Tom again for presenting. Excellent presentation, and I look forward to the, the next two patent webinars uh, coming up. So thank you all again, and uh, thank you all for participating today.